Okay, thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, thanks for having me. I'm not supposed to be here giving this talk. It was set up by my grad student who um, graduated on time, but early because we're a year late. And uh, I had no idea this talk was happening. She didn't tell me. <laughs> and now I'm here. Um, so uh, this is not something that we typically work on. We've been working on um, this project for a couple years and, and published a paper not just on iron, um, but on a variety of um, non-traditional herbicidal controls that I think maybe Clint's going to talk about next. Um, but I'll share some of the information that we have as it relates to iron. I've personally been working with iron um, as it relates to annual meadow grass for 14 years now. We have a long project and I'm going to try and touch on it if I have time. Um, but I will kind of just give the overview of um, how iron works and some of the products that can be used. So why do we need to control clover? or dandelion. Um, this is a fraternity house on Penn State's campus um, that I walked by a few weeks ago, um, and this is what it looks like. Um, the, the fraternity got shut down and they got kicked off, so nobody maintains it. Um, I would argue that some people probably like this, that this is okay for them. Um, the number one complaint we get about something like this from homeowners is all the bees that are then associated with um, the clover that comes. Um, in the same respect, dandelion, um, very beautiful yellow flower. It's my mother-in-law's house. I'm not responsible for taking care of her lawn. Um, obviously, uh, another issue in terms of inconsistency. Obviously, in the United States, and I'm sure there's some places here, um, people are pretty crazy about their lawns. And, and that only became more exacerbated with the pandemic. They were home. They had nothing to do. And so taking care of their lawns became um, a much bigger issue. And so. If we look at some of the limitations and some of the options that we have, in the United States, we're very fortunate that we still have quite a few herbicides um, that are available to us, but we have issues, right? Just going all the way back to you know, identification, um, identifying the weeds properly so that you pick the correct herbicides. The use of the herbicides to not overdo it to then you know, result in resistance, which herbicide resistance is becoming a bigger issue. Your issues, probably government restrictions, the lack of or limitations of herbicides um, available for use in home lawns. Um, we see the same thing in the United States coming as well. And then I think, you know, I've been teaching at Penn State for 14 years, and I've seen a shift in the mindset of the students that have come through. Um, Niels was one of my first students, um, and, and they're different than what Niels is. <laughs> they, they are really concerned in considering the environment much more than they did even 14, 15 years ago. Um, then we have the issues in terms of what are we trying to manage, like how high quality, how high of a quality of turf are we trying to maintain? Does it need to be perfect? Is that picture of the clover, you know, dominating the lawn okay? That's a very subject subjective. Um, and then we have things like maintenance practices, establishing things from the beginning to ensure that you have a dense stand, proper fertilization, bioherbicides, there's people working on thermal weed control, um, allelopathic control, and then we'll, I'll talk about um, these organic herbicides, or in this case, iron um, that I'll mention. So if we start talking about iron, the first thing is to make sure that we're talking about chelated iron. So iron can, um, can uh, react with oxygen um, and hydroxide, and so you have to put a chelator with it so that it's more available to the plant, doesn't leach through the soil, um, and it protects it from that oxidation. So we're not just talking about getting iron sulfate and going out and spraying it. We're talking about chelated iron. I think it's important um, to know that, and there's, is there a laser on this? There's several different types of chelators um, that can be used with iron. The benefits? Generally, I'll say generally, relatively safe on turf grasses, um, most of the cool season grasses, uh, maybe a little bit on the uh, warm season grasses, you can possibly get a little bit of discoloration. And then I put annual bluegrass or annual meadow grass and bent grass at the bottom. Pretty safe on these, but I'll touch on um, where that can be used for people that are interested in golf, not necessarily home lawns. And then there's a whole list of weeds that are labeled. If you go through the labels of all these products um, and they list a bunch of different weeds, um, some of them are suppression, so you have to be careful about that. If it says it suppresses it, it probably is going to like ding it up a little bit and it'll come back. If it says it controls it, it probably works fairly well. Um, in the U.S., we have a lot of products that are sold with chelated iron. Um, Fiesta is the one that we worked with and is probably the one that's the most common. I believe that you have Fiesta in the EU. Is that correct? Does anybody know that? I looked it up, it says you have it. I don't know if you have it, uh, but that's an iron-based product, a chelated iron-based product, and there's a bunch that are available um, for turf. 
Obviously, with anything we're applying, whether it's an organic, you know, iron product and a chelated iron, we do have precautions. Um, don't apply when the turf is under stress or under drought stress. Um, don't apply when it exceeds. That's supposed to be 29 degrees, so it's about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I don't know how often it gets above 30 degrees here, but if it's a day that's going to be hot, it could cause some phytotoxicity. You have to worry about some things as it relates to seedlings and young turf because they're going to be more susceptible. Um, you don't want to spray it on any other desirable plants, and if you do, you want to wash it off because that could result in some um, unintended uh, harm to the, the non-targeted uh, plants. Um, don't apply when there's any chance of irrigation or rain coming within three hours. It needs to basically dry on that surface to be effective. Um, and then they have limitations on the total number of times. So the limitations don't apply more than four times a year. That's good in the sense that we're not applying too much, but it also indicates that we need to make multiple applications, as you'll see from some of the, the data. So when I went through and was putting this talk together, this was not my talk, but I went through and looked at it to put it together, and, and there are several studies that have been done, a few studies, um, looking at different timings of these iron-based products. So um, a study done in 2013 at Ohio State, uh, spring applications, they made three applications of Fiesta. In this case, it was um, in 2,000 liters per hectare of carrier volume, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually half the volume of most of the studies that go out. Um, they got excellent control in the spring of dandelion, clover, and ground ivy. So pretty good success. A similar type study that went out in the summertime, um, weed control was a little bit different. They got pretty good control with the first app of clover, but the dandelion, um, it ended up bouncing back and recovering. So think of a home lawn operator in the United States. The last thing they want to have is callbacks. That's money spent, especially how fuel costs are rising. Um, you don't want to have to go back to that property, and so this would be you know, a potential issue. And then somebody else, um, I think it was Pam uh, Carboneau in Canada, did fall apps, um, three apps with Fiesta, and they got great control of the weeds in the fall. But then in the spring, they rebounded and came back. So this is probably something until you can get those weeds under control. And I would argue it would probably take a few years if you started with the first photo that I showed, um, that this is going to be a repeated application type of thing annually. Um, but they do work. Um, so the challenge in some cases, first of all, relatively high carrier volumes. People were putting them out at either 2,000 or 4,000 liters per hectare, which is like spraying it through a fire hose. It's a lot of material going out. On golf courses, when we're talking about making applications, maybe 400, maybe 800 liters per hectare. That's, that would be a typical rate. So we're talking you know, upwards of 10 times that. Um, and it came down to the function of the amount of iron that was in it. So that 4% solution if you're at a higher volume or an 8% solution at a lower volume. And the timings I already mentioned, right? You need multiple applications, probably upwards of around three. And the timing is going to be dependent upon the, the efficacy of the control. Spring being the best, fall being pretty good, and summer being not quite as good. Um, and that might have to do with temperature issues and, and those types of things. Um, so we did publish a study that was part of this uh, conference, is w which is why we were here to present some of this. Um, and this was looking at a, a wide array of non-traditional and traditional herbicides. Um, and so I'll show a little bit of that data and I'll highlight the, um, the iron products in here. So if we look at dandelion control in perennial ryegrass, we got, I would consider, excellent control. And this goes up against even some of our traditional um, herbicides. And we got pretty, control, pretty good control. And I think this is no control in this trimec because it was going to be the first application when we took this rating. So that's basically no, no pesticide product has been put out. But pretty good control there. We had some good control with a few other products, and I'll, I'll mention that um, as I talk about the, the injury that it caused. But in this case, we got good control with Fiesta. Clover control, same thing. A few other products worked a little bit better. Um, and there's the Fiesta for clover control. But then when we get into turf grass industry, we typically rate these on a 1 to 9 or a 1 to 10 scale, um, 6 being the minimal level of acceptable quality that you could have for a stand, in this case, like a home lawn. Um, and some of those products, like the horticulture vinegar that provided control of certain weeds, also cause 
pretty significant injury to the turf grass. And this is after several applications and the turf grass starting to recover. But we can see some of these products cause injury. And that's the balance with um, a variety of these products. But iron seems to be on the safe side, whereas others tend to cause damage, but they might be effective, or they cause no damage, but they're not effective. And that's the tricky part um, about this. Okay, So we have Fiesta there, around an 8, really good quality. Um, anybody that's applied iron to turf knows you get an immediate dark greening response. And that's the same thing that we have um, in these trials. So to summarize, to summarize this part of it, um, it worked, right? The chelated iron products work. You have to get the timing right, and you have to get the number of applications right. When we compared it to other organic or what we would consider biopesticides, then you get into the trouble of it worked but caused injury, or it didn't work and it was safe. And both of those combinations are not really what we're going for. Um, and then when we compared it also to some other things like citrus oil or just a fertilizer or urea applications to create a dense stand, we think of clover anyway as being a low nitrogen type uh, pest or weed. Um, we didn't really get any control from that. It didn't really help, um, at least under the populations that we're dealing with. And you can see in this photo here some of the different injury that would be caused um, either to the, the weed itself or to the stand of turf. OK, so pros and cons, as with anything that we're talking about when we're trying to manage our, our turf pests, um, relatively safe, I think that's a positive. We're not as concerned about causing significant damage to our desirable uh, turf grass species. It acts quickly. So if you're dealing with a homeowner or somebody in the lawn care operating business, they like to see that instant gratification, right? The turf weeds start to decline right away. You feel like it's working and it's happening. Um, you get a dark green response in the turf because of the iron. Um, and another positive is, is it does work. Some of these products need the heat or need the hot weather to be able to be effective to control the weeds. In this case, the iron tends to work at temperatures you know, as, as low as and above 10 degrees C. So that's pretty low, which means you have a pretty wide window to be able to make the applications. And once it dries, it's labeled here on the, on the bottle. It's safe for pets and other people to be um, walking around. Um, the negatives are you got to make applications about every three weeks. And you got to get probably three applications out. And so that comes at a couple things, labor, and a cost of the product, which I'll mention next. Um, you can get at really high rates, you can get a thinning of the turf stand. It tends to kind of just thin it out a little bit. Not so much a problem. Um, and then there's all these limitations on what you can and can't do and, and when you can apply it. Um, and then things that you don't even think about, how are you making these applications? Is, are these high iron rates going to be corrosive to the, to the equipment that you're using? Are you going to have that as an added cost? That could be a concern for people. Um, so I asked, is Sean Askew in here? Sean Askew provided this slide. He's a Virginia Tech, his uh, grad student, Clebson. I said, what are the costs of these things? I don't really look at costs. Like, I deal mostly with golf courses, and I'm just like, well, if you want to do cheap, I'll tell you this. If you want to do expensive, I'll tell you that. It doesn't matter to me. But costs is a big, are big deals, right? And this is a list of all these alternative products. Fiesta, this is cost per acre in US dollars. You're talking around $700 per hectare which is divided by two is probably like 200 to $250 per acre. Um, and then they have other products here, like this product that's an iron um, chelator. This one's upwards of $10,000 per hectare per application. I would say that that's not going to be feasible in terms of people realistically being able to do that. Um, and then I don't know what this one is, this green gobbler. I just looked it up in the back of the room. Um, it's vinegar. You basically take vinegar and put it out at a high rate, 40%, almost $13,000 per hectare. I mean, we're trying everything we can to, to look at these products, but some of them are just ridiculous um, and out of, the, out of the realm for most people. Um, OK, so how many people are here in golf? OK, a lot, right? So I figured that, so I thought I would add on these couple slides as a prelude um, to a project we've been working on for 13, 14 years now, and that my grad student's going to be talking about on Wednesday. So, Around when I started at Penn State in 2009, I started hearing these stories about these non-traditional methods of controlling annual meadow grass on creeping bentgrass putting greens. Um, and, and a big part of that was the use of iron, in addition to some other things. But um, iron. And this is what it looks like when you put it out on your putting. And Neil's was probably the first course 
that I visited in California that was on the program, and I have pictures of him making these applications. So um, it's a big circle back now, Niels. So iron and turf, um, there's been research that showed that it suppresses annual meadowgrass more than bentgrass. Suppresses them both, but it suppresses one more than the other. So that's one thing. Um, and there was this emerging management philosophy that was like, we're going to go really low nitrogen, you know, 24 kilos per year, um, really high rates of iron, you know, upwards of a pound or 49 kilograms every three weeks. And, and we're going to use repeated applications of type B PGRs, which you don't have here, I don't believe, right? No type B PGRs, paclobutrazol, fluoroprimidol. You do have trinexapec ethyl though, right? Yes, yes, okay. So, and then they also said, you'll never have to aerify your greens again. We're going to use the acidification theory. We're going to top dress the heck out of them. We're going to mow them ultra low, two millimeters. Um, and you're going to have perfectly bent grass greens with no problems anymore. And I was like, this is total BS. I don't believe it. So we started a trial and we looked at it. Um, this is what it looks like. I mean, you could say that's good quality if you want. I would say it doesn't. Um, it doesn't always look like this, but, but it can look like that. As the iron relates to it, in the first two years of the study, we saw a significant impact of iron under plots that were maintained under low nitrogen. So as long as we had low nitrogen, a half a pound per year or 40, uh, 24 kilos, then we saw a rate effect of iron that is at least, maybe it's not reducing the POA, but it's, it's maintaining it at a lower level. So you can see here, these are our low nitrogen plots, no iron, you know, a quarter pound of iron, which is 12 kilos per hectare, and then a pound of iron, which is 49 kilos per hectare. Only when we starve the plant of nitrogen did we see a response. When we gave it 150 kilos per year of nitrogen, iron had no impact. So that was an interesting find for us to make. After that, we're now on our 13th year, we see no differences from iron. Doesn't make a difference. But in the early stages, it did. Um, but most of the work that was going on in this case is not going to be done from the iron. It's going to be done from that PGR that you don't have. What we've learned after 13 years is that if you put down a normal amount of nitrogen, 150 kilos per year, and trinexapec ethyl, you're going you're gonna to highly favor poa annuals being, or annual bluegrass, annual meadowgrass being your dominant species. If you starve the plant and you have the PGRs, or you don't, you can slowly get this down. Um, the data that, that Kai Yuen will show tomorrow, um, we're at 2018, I think his data is up through, and all of these plots, this is primo, this is no PGR, they're all down around 15%. So starving the nitrogen, um, starving the plant of nitrogen actually really uh, does a pretty good job for reducing annual meadowgrass. So the take home message, and I'll end with this, um, chelated iron has a lot of good uh, uses. It's very efficient in terms of controlling some of the broadleaf weeds. It can be used early on in combinations to reduce annual meadowgrass on bent grass greens. But you have to make several applications, and I would suggest, because of the discoloration that you can get, that you test it out in small doses um, and really feel comfortable with the rates that you're using and the volumes you're applying to make sure that you're comfortable with the results that you're going to get. So it works. Looks pretty good. There's still some tweaking to do at every course. So with that, I will uh, leave this slide up here. This is a QR code to the paper that we published if you wanted to see it. And I know that we're a minute over, but if there's time for a question, I can do it later or I can do it now.